uh, we have uh, the sincere pleasure to welcoming to the Nufti stage uh, a panel uh, on the Islamic Republic's role in the Middle East, moderated by uh, what I think many, if not most, consider uh, Washington's most distinguished uh, Iran expert uh, and a good friend, Mr. Karim Sajjadpour of the Carnegie uh, Endowment. Thank you, Karim, and thank you all, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen. That, that's not true, but very kind introduction. It's wonderful to see so many friendly faces. Uh, this is going to be a super spreading event, spreading knowledge about the Middle East. Uh, so I'll be very brief, because I think we only have like 50, 55 minutes. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce folks, um, jump into some questions, and then hopefully we'll have time for questions from all of you. Uh, maybe I'll introduce you in reverse, reverse order. So on the far left is uh, Professor Bernie Haeckel at Princeton University, who is widely considered to be the top expert in, in the world, frankly, on, on, on the Gulf, on Islamist movements, born in Beirut. Um, to, to Bernie's right is Fatima Abu Asad. She is of Yemeni origin. She's affiliated with the <coughs> Middle East Institute. Uh, Joel Rayburn is in the center. Um, he was uh, the right-hand person of General David Petraeus. He served in Iraq. He served in Afghanistan. Um, his most recent job was uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for um, the Levant. He managed Syria policy during the Trump administration. Um, West Point grad, but also has a, a PhD in history, so he's both an officer and a gentleman. And to my left, uh, my old friend Hanin Qadar from um, Lebanon. She, she was also raised um, in Lebanon. Her affiliation is with the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And I'm remiss in, in, in thanking Cameron and, and Dr. Ganji for putting this wonderful uh, event together. So um, I, I told Joel I would start with him because he's the one who has had most recent government experience. As I mentioned, he spent really the last two decades of his life looking at Iran um, in, in the region, um, both up close, serving in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, but also from Washington. And I'm wondering, Joel, if you can just kind of reflect over the last two decades, what are the patterns you've seen um, in Iran's regional strategy in Iraq and in, in, in Syria? And I guess an added part to that is that there is now this conventional wisdom that uh, Iran won, Assad won in Syria, the Shia militias have prevailed in Iraq. Um, is that an accurate assessment in your view? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I think the answer is uh, no one has yet won anything uh, there is a regional conflict still going on. Its uh, outcome is very much in question. Um, the, uh, uh, the Iranian regime, which uh, uh, projects its power through the rest of the region, its, its military power, its intelligence and you know, its proxy power through the IRGC Quds Force, uh, it has, it, there's a ceiling for, it's limited in, in really how much power it can export. And what we find is that it's generally, it's not that, they, that the IRGC Quds Force, the Iranian regime and its proxies are extraordinarily more capable uh, than everybody else in the region or those who want to dominate the region. They're generally uncontested or they're, they're very lightly contested. And that, that's because I think, I think people are, are, have, uh, policymakers for a long time now have missed uh, or they failed to take account of what is a concerted Iranian regime strategy uh, to consolidate uh, hegemonic control of the rest of the region in a very specific way. I don't, I don't mean sort of conceptually, and, uh, but, uh, but they, have, they have been executing for several years now a concerted strategy to reach through Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon and consolidate control of a largely proxy axis through the northern Middle East so that they can, uh, they can reach the Mediterranean and exert influence in the Mediterranean. And also that east to west axis uh, under IRGC control, dominant influence, is also meant to sever the natural connection between the Gulf and Europe. The Iranian regime wants to cut and be able to control the relationship and the trade routes between the energy producers of the Middle East and the energy consumers of Europe and the energy consumers of the Far East. So you see them reaching through, I mean, essentially cutting Turkey off from its natural channel to, to the Gulf, uh, being able to control the natural Mediterranean to the Zagros Mountains 
uh, you know, the, the old Silk Road. These are now coming under, under uh, Iranian domination, or at least that's the aim so far. And that is why the Iranian regime for several years now has been trying to establish strategic outposts in Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon that they can use uh, to uh, deter and to project a new threat uh, to the rest of the region. I think what they would like to do with these strategic outposts is to create a kind of North Korea versus Seoul type of dynamic where there's constant existential blackmail going on. And, and you find that every move uh, is in check, can be checked uh, by the Iranian regime. This is also why, as they've reached through the northern Middle East, they've reached around to the Babel Mandeb and the Red Sea to establish a strategic outpost in Yemen so that they can do a pincer movement, essentially, around uh, the Arabian Peninsula and the, and the central Middle East so that they can control the Strait of Hormuz, the Babel Mandeb, and be able to reach into the Mediterranean, make the Suez Canal moot if they want to, have missiles that could, uh, that could destroy the function of the Suez Canal anytime they want to, and then the energy heart of the world economy is under their domination. This is the IRGC plan. They, this is their dream. They would like to use that uh, uh, to be what, what they think will be a superpower controlling the energy, uh, the heart of what drives the, the global economy. And, and so far, uh, there's not a concerted response to that. Uh, so far, they've been able to uh, distract the world into the near red herring of the nuclear program and the nuclear deal, ignoring all of this other, these other moves. John, you, you were in government when Qasem Soleimani was assassinated. How, yeah. how did that change uh, Iran's capabilities in Iraq? It, 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 had a quite, it, it had a quite disruptive effect because Qasem Soleimani had been, uh, as the commander of the Quds Force, uh, he's like the CENTCOM commander, the Secretary of State, the CIA director, National Security Advisor sort of rolled all into one. The JSOC commander sort of rolled into one. And he'd been doing that for a quarter of a century. So everyone, all the proxies and all the political players in Iraq and Syria and Lebanon had been seeing only one guy for 24 years. He's, and and he, he knew everything about them. In many cases, uh, he uh, was able to influence their own careers. And it, so there was a remarkable continuity uh, and a remarkable set of relationships. Uh, there was no way, it, there was, there was a, uh, it was inevitable that his removal would lead to a drop off uh, because all of that legitimacy, credibility, history that he had across the entire region uh, could not be inherited by just the next, uh, the next deputy commander in line. And Ismail Ghani, I think, was poorly suited because he was not a guy whose career, uh, career experience in the IRGC was in the Arab world. It was in Afghanistan. Uh, so he came, he came to the new job not really being able to communicate in Arabic, not having the same history, and there was a se severe drop-off. In addition, Qasem Soleimani was a guy who had all the threads coming to himself personally uh, over, over the years. And so there were a whole bunch of policies and relationships and plans and strategies that were only in his head. And so when, when his head <laughs> went dead, uh, so did, there, there, were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of those threads that were severed. And there was, there was a big, there was a big drop off. He was a guy, I think, notoriously, who did not share information across his organization. He preferred to deal with his micromanager who dealt with his organization in stovepipes. So it was a big drop off. And it'll, it, it would take years and years for anyone, even someone better than Ismail Ghani, to sort of get back that kind of capability and credibility. It was, it was a, an extremely significant step. Very good. I'm going to follow up with you uh, in the second round about U.S. policy, but I'll go next to Hanin. And Hanina, I neglected to mention you can't go back to Lebanon, or you could, but it would be a one-way ticket like many of us going back to Iran um, because of threats to your security by, by Hezbollah. And I'm wondering how would you assess the strength of Hezbollah now? Um, there is a sense that it's this um, somewhat contradiction and that we started, we've started to see um, anti-Iran uh, protests in Hezbollah strongholds like the city of Nabatea, just as we saw it in, in Karbala, which is you know, a Shiite stronghold in Iraq. 
So on one hand, it seems that they have um, their support within the Shia community is somewhat waning, but at the same time, that doesn't that doesn't seem to be any um, any kind of meaningful uh, uh, opposition uh, to them, which has diminished their power. And mm. so you see the biggest threat to Hezbollah being internal, lack of waning support within their own community, yep. or is it external? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Karim. And I would like to follow up on what Joe uh, said about Qasem Soleimani when we talk about the external. But let me start with the internal first. Uh, Hezbollah is challenged internally and externally, and Hezbollah still has a lot of strength internally and externally. It's not black and white here. It's really about uh, the challenges they're facing and how they're trying to circumvent these, uh, these challenges. Internally, when Hezbollah came to the Shia community, they came as a father figure. And they came with three pillars of support. One is the resistance, but not the national resistance that used to exist in Lebanon before Hezbollah. They came as an Islamic resistance. And this is one of the main pillars. I will protect you, I will liberate you, but you are Shia. You know, it's an Islamic resistance. It's not just a national resistance anymore. They came with services and jobs. I will provide for you. And they came with a big Shia identity linked to the Wilayat al-Faqih, not to Najaf anymore. So this package of a father figure, empowering father figure, they came to the Shia community and they said, this is what I provide for you and this is who you are today. Forget about the state. Forget about, forget about your Lebanese identity, Arab identity, Najafi Shia identity, and you are today affiliated with Iran's Wilayat al-Faqih, and I will take care of everything. And that's what happened. They liberated uh, the South. They, they, they pretended to be the resistance for many years as like the resistance is the goal. And then suddenly, things started to fall apart. The three pillars today are falling apart. One, they, because of so many sanctions on Iran that happened, and they actually, the leaders of Hezbollah admitted that 70%, there was an article interview yesterday in the Figaro with uh, Georges Malpronon, who, who actually interviewed the Safi Dean, and he admitted 70% of the resources today come from Lebanon, not from Iran. This means that they are admitting that they are basically milking Lebanon's economy. And they're saying it, no, no, no more hiding it because everybody knows. They can provide the jobs that they used to provide. They can provide the services. They shrank the services from the Shia community as a whole, eventually to the Hezbollah community, which is members and supporters. And today, the services really are catering for a very core community, which is the fighters, the members, and, and, and the, the elite, basically. So it's, it's not everyone benefits today. But these are the important part that they need today, and they are going to give them fresh dollars again, right? However, the father figure image has collapsed. Which means also that this Shia identity that they wanted is collapsing. And that's why you see a lot of people in the streets in the south of Lebanon, in the Bekaa, everywhere. They, 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 they map, they, when you look at it, I just finished a map on it for, for my book on this. And, and, and you look at the map, it's massive, it's, it's huge. But the alternative that you talked about is very important. When someone presents themselves as an alternative today in the Shia community, they get killed. Exactly one year ago, Luqman Islim got killed because he was the alternative voice after 2019 protests. So there are alternatives. There are many people who understand today the limits of their representation and the limits of their maneuver. If they know that if they get beyond a certain limit, they will be ki killed. So they, they function within a certain uh, bubble that Hezbollah allows for the opposition. But also, if they stay within this bubble, they will not be effective anymore. So this is their main internal challenge, and that's how they're circumventing it through violence, the use of arms, assassinations. They will never stop. Another Lebanon's kind of beyond the Shia community challenge is, is, is the 2019 protest, which clearly showed that Hezbollah today is the authority. Hezbollah sided with a corrupt political class instead of the people on the street, and that was a big shock for many people in Lebanon. Suddenly, Hezbollah worked so hard to win the elections in 2018. They became the authority. They started to decide who does what. One year later, Lebanon collapses. This says everything. Externally, just to move quickly, uh, I can talk about this for days, but I'll stop here. Uh, externally, I think Qasem Soleimani is a big 
example here. Not only their weapons need to be refurbished and uh, renovated, it's like you, you hear in Lebanon suddenly we weapon depots exploding by themselves because they're expiring. And today, Hezbollah, the threat of the weapons today is much more efficient than the weapons themselves. You know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's becoming more of, you know, like we have the weapons, you have to listen to us, but we can't really use the weapons because we don't want conflicts with Israel. <laughs> and that's why they haven't been retaliating at all to anything because they know they don't have the capabilities, the same capability. Qasem Soleimani actually in a way ruined Hezbollah. They had Ahmad Maghni, who was assassinated, and then they had Mustafa Badreddin, who was killed by Soleimani himself. And when Mustafa Badreddin was removed, Soleimani came in hands on and said, I am your commander. Instead of uh, really bringing someone to replace Badreddin, like Ahmad Maghni, and, 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 and doing something to have someone to, you know, he should have understood that he's not indestructible. So what happened is that when Qasem Soleimani died, there was no one as a military commander for Hezbollah. Militarily, they don't have anyone. Anyone. Qani, again, is not a Hezbollah military commander. So they what Qasem Soleimani did, he, he removed the commander. They didn't replace him with, he replaced him with four junior ones, which is not enough. And he became the commander, and then he died. So they're, they're, they're a mess, like in Iraq, you see that, that they try to bring in Hezbollah to, to, to deal with the mess, the Iraqi do not want to deal with them, and nobody listens to anybody. So that's, that's the effect of Soleimani, another external I challenge. Mean, let me ask you a brief follow-up. Um, mm. You said 70% of their resources are internal, that's, not external. Okay, let, let's, well, let, let's let me, say... Let me ask you, and then you, you, can, yeah. you can pack that into your answer, because uh -huh. um, I think one of the things that uh, we often get wrong about Iran, there's a perception, well, uh, Iranians may be religious, therefore they support an Islamic mm. republic, theocracy. Mm -hmm. And you know what I've always told people is that in fact it's people who are genuinely pious who often feel most offended by the Islamic Republic of Iran mm -hmm. because they rule from a moral pedestal, but very little of what they do is, um, is moral behavior and engage in all types of um, corruption. And you know, I tell people if, if you find out your, your butcher is stealing from you, uh, it, it frankly offends you far more if you find out your priest or your imam or your rabbi is stealing from you. Yeah. And so my, my question is, <laughs> among that 70% you talked about is, is major drug trafficking, um, mm, like yeah. Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering how, um, uh, including Lebanese Shia, you're, you're part of your family is, is pious. How do they think yeah. about Hezbollah four, <laughs> four decades uh, later? Yeah. Are they just kind of like this fighting force um, that they need, or is there disillusionment like we see in Iran with this very corrupt religious uh, yes. establishment? No, no, this is a very good question. Well, let me just start with the 70% that Matt Hashim Safidi mentioned yesterday. It doesn't mean that it's true. Like, it's, it's, it, this is not about the fact. This is about the message behind it. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if it's 70% or 60% or there's a reason why he's saying that. It, the fact that a Hezbollah official actually says that Iran is not helping God is, is I think it's, it's, it's crazy because... I don't think they can hide anything anymore. When Luqman Islim was killed, you know, they, they, they kind of celebrated it. Like, they really don't care about hiding anymore. So, because exactly this, because people see them today as they are. And it's not about people being pious or not. There are some leftists, atheists in Lebanon who still support Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not, for, for many people in Lebanon, it's not an ideology, it's politics. And it's not about uh, Iran, it's about Israel, mm -hmm. right? So this is mainly the, the dividing lines here, but it's, uh, it's, it's changing because also another thing happened in Lebanon is with the protest 2005 and, and then mainly the Arab Spring and the protest of 2019, if these things achieved anything, it taught people in the region, but also in Lebanon, that the enemy is within. And when you start seeing the enemy within, you see that Hezbollah is protecting corruption, and then you see that Hezbollah is actually corrupt. Mm -hmm. Because Wafi Safa and the Musawi brothers who are involved in all these captagon production and smuggling and the fact that in daylight, in front of everyone, they are taking all the Lebanese subsidized fuel and wheat and medicine in daylight and smuggling it out to Syria while the Lebanese are hungry. Mm. And then all these guys who are actually, you know, like uh, selling subsidized medicine, it's all Hezbollah, the corrupt Hezbollah. It's not just them protecting. 2019 showed that Hezbollah is protecting the corruption which led to Lebanon's fall. And then two years later, people realize it's not that they're just protecting the corruption, they are corrupt. They are the corruption, yes. So yes. Joel, you said that yes. about uh, 
the Syrian regime. They, yeah. they aren't protecting the drug dealers. They are the drug yeah, dealers. Yeah, they are exactly. the cartel. Yeah, yeah. So, the cartel, uh, exactly. They're uh, a cartel <coughs> now. They're no longer resistance for the people. Resistance is dead or in a coma. Mm. They put resistance on the side, and people can see that these guys have put resistance on it in a coma and a mafia. becoming a cartel. Yeah. That's it. Uh, Fatima, I, I'm guessing that a lot of people in this room have partied in Beirut before. I'm guessing very few have partied in Sana'a. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I suspect if I had to just make a guess that less, less than 1% of Iranians have probably ever set foot in Yemen. So there's a lot more knowledge about other parts of the region than, than uh, Iran's role in Yemen. And I should have said from the outset that um, you, know, you look at Iran's influence in, in the region, and it essentially um, has primacy in four failed or failing states, right? Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen. You could add to that Venezuela as well. And so there is a pattern we see here. And I, so I, I guess what I'd like you to do, Fatima, is start off a little bit uh, broader and, and describing both the Houthis, the Iran-Houthi relationship. There was a, a perception when I first started doing this work a while back that uh, Hezbollah could be peeled away from Iran. I think everyone now realizes that's a <laughs> fiction. Um, is that possible in the case of the Houthis? Could the Houthis be potentially peeled away from Iran, or are they a client the same way Hezbollah is essentially an arm of the Revolutionary Guards? Thank you, Karine. Um, it's a struggle because um, still in, in, in Washington, D.C., some policymakers will tell you there's still no relationship between Iran and the Houthis, uh, which is flabbergasting given the amount of piling evidence that has uh, mm. been seen throughout the years. So, um, you know, since the, the conflict erupted in 2015, when the Houthis marched into the capital of Sana'a, there has been this sense of denial. And this, this basically stems from the fact that um, the Houthis um, have been in conflict with the government of Yemen since 2003. Um, and uh, Hussein Badruddin al-Houthi, who was um, a former member of parliament, um, protested the political corruption of uh, former President Ali Abdullah Saleh. And, um, you know, he, he was a well-respected scholar in the Zaidi community, and um, I'm sure, and Zaydis have some relations to um, Shia. So, in a sense, um, uh, many, many Sunnis see, see, see them sort of like on the border of Shiism, but also many Shia see Zaydi on the border of Sunnism. So, they're somewhere in between. Um, and, and in a sense, they were never really acknowledged as a Shia community until really recently. Um, and it's something that, you know, pious Zaidi scholars will tell you that they're not necessarily Shia, uh, but um, uh, they're, they're seeing that they're becoming more Khomeinist uh, with time. So uh, in, in 2003, Hussein Badruddin al-Houthi intercepted um, the President Ali Abdullah Saleh motorcade um, challenged him, and uh, uh, after skirmishes, he was um, killed by President Ali Abdullah Saleh, and the movement uh, was continued going on. His father carried the banner, and after that, uh, his brother, um, Abdel Malik al-Houthi, became sort of like the supreme leader of, of the movement, and uh, continued fighting uh, in, under his name in, in like six brutal Sada wars that you know, when I was living in Yemen, we would hear we would hear about, but they were somewhere over there, just remote. Um, uh, at that time, of course, um, there was some evidence of Iranian and Hezbollah's um, support for uh, the Houthis, but it was always dismissed uh, because no one trusted the former president Ali Abdullah Saleh. Um, ironically, though, um, in 2015, when the Houthis advanced uh, to the capital, it happened, it's, it's very important to notice that it happened after um, the Arab Spring. So 2011 was the wave of Arab Spring, Yemen was one of the countries that wanted to see its president fall, and um, there was a, a peaceful transition of power where Abd al Mansour Hadi claimed, uh, or was, was the consensus candidate. And then there was a national dialogue process whereby all the parties, um, including the Houthis, came to the table to discuss the future of the nation. But of course, Houthis seeing the chaos that ensued in the capital, seeing that there was a political vacuum that was there, they thought this is the perfect time for them to impose their agenda and seize power. 
but the irony here is that um, they've allied with um, Ali Abdullah Saleh in order to do so. So um, they've al to see Abdul Malik al Houthi shake hands with the person who killed his brother mm. tells you a lot about <laughs> the, ideology, the ideology of the movement. It doesn't exist. It's not about ideology. It's not about you know, political expediency, but it's much more about really serving someone else's agenda. They're extremely strategic. And um, that alliance- well, question, When you say serving someone else's agenda, who, whom do you mean? It, it, became, it became clear from that point on that this is, this is a regional play. Um, Whose the, agenda? Uh, the Islamic Republic's okay, agenda, I pretty much. Stop things out for you. Because yeah. one, one of the um, things that people have noted about the Houthis, I certainly have noted that among the slogans, you know, death to America, death That's to right. the Jews, death to Israel, but death to Baha'is. You don't have that many um, Baha'is in, in Yemen, <laughs> Yemen, right? And, and so that, that for me was just kind of a telltale sign that, yes, the ideology is coming from elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, and, um, you know, when you said earlier on, it's kind of like the pious people in the community that become offended. And it was basically um, uh, the, the co-founder of um, Shabab, uh, the Believing Youth, um, as Muhammad Azan, who is a, uh, was a friend of Hussein Badruddin al-Houthi. They established the Believing Youth together. Um, he is, he's now in self-exile in uh, Jordan, but he was the person who kind of feel, felt offended by the slogans that came out. He said, this, this has nothing to do with what Zaydism is. You know, it's nothing that we want to teach our community um, because essentially, um, Hussein Badruddin al Houthi wanted to preserve the Zaydi faith, it, it, fearing the Wahhabi encroachment that was coming from Saudi Arabia, especially in places like Sada, where it is the, um, um, the center of, of Zaydi faith. So seeing that a lot of the Yemeni kids were you know, going into Sunni or, or Wahhabi tendencies, um, they've developed this, this institute in order to preserve their faith, but unfortunately, um, it was, you know, after, after visits of al-Houthi to, to Iran, came back um, with this, this ideology that is completely um, focused on fighting political corruption, and by that it means Zionism, mm. um, President Saleh's alliance with the Gulf states and with um, the United States. Uh, uh, Hussein al-Houthi, the, 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 the founder had studied in Qom, I, I believe, right, in the seminaries of Qom um, in the 80s. Uh, I'm mindful of this timeline, that, uh, this clock that's staring at me. I, I wanted to follow up, Fatima, and just kind of reiterate what I asked you. Uh, um, maybe you can just spell it out, that in your view, if we consider you know, Hezbollah an arm of the Revolutionary Guards, we consider um, the, the Assad regime, the Shia militias, an arm of the Revolutionary Guards, is that how you also see the Houthis, or is there a chance that somehow they could be, um, you could create some um, fissures there? Uh, Plainly, it's, it's impossible. Like, plainly, um, the Houthis cannot survive without Iran's support. There is, there is common ground. There are so many, so many factors. A, there's trust. The Houthis completely trust um, the Islamic Republic. And um, that's something that has been cultivated you know, throughout the years, throughout persistent, consistent um, support from the Islamic Republic since 79. Then second, they're completely enamored with the Islamic mm. Revolution's idea. Um, you know, in a sense, um, Iran to, to, or the Islamic Republic to somebody from, from Yemen or to a Houthi follower is kind of like what the US is for an educated person who wants to, mm. you know, go to the, so it is, it is a sense, it stands for something. And um, Abdel Malik al Houthi is selling this dream of power, you know, power mm. against the Saudis, power against the, the United States. You know, it's completely in line with, you know, with these uh, uh, hungry um, uh, and uneducated and, um, uh, uh, you know, marginalized people are, you know, yearning for so some sort of like, you know, divine justice because mm. someone else is doing this. So there's this narrative of victimization that throws into the Houthi movement, which is, you know, there. And of course, there's common ground, you know, which they don't have with the Saudis. Um, the common ground, whether it is in, um, you know, feeling that their ideology is compatible. And it's, it's, it's in so many ways, 
um, they become just much, much closer. And of course, you know, given the relationship with the IRGC, given the relationship with Hezbollah, um, you can, you know, it, it is, it has become, they've become much closer to them than the, than the Saudis. And also, you know, given the fact that the Saudis have not played, um, uh, ha haven't been really intelligent throughout of this, haven't really been able to um, infiltrate the Houthi in a way that could change the, the course of this war, um, the humanitarian catastrophe that they've been caused by, you know, using the, the sheer force of military conventional power, that has all like led into the, the you know, benefit to the Houthis. So they're, they're, they don't really have an incentive yes. to... No, it's a good point. I think when we look at Iran's regional power and influence, so much of this is, is more about mistakes of, you know, Arab countries, frankly, mistakes of the United States uh, and Iran, um, you know, taking advantage of that more than, you know, Iran's um, remarkable capacities. I, I'm going to go to now to, to Bernie. Bernie, I think a lot of people, even in this room, there's a perception among uh, Iranians that somehow Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia benefit from having the Islamic Republic of Iran in power because it keeps Iran uh, isolated uh, and it, you know, it serves as a pretext for the U.S.-Saudi uh, uh, <coughs> alliance. Is, is that an accurate perception in your view? Um, thank you, first, for inviting me. I, 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 um, I wanted to say just one thing about Yemen before answering Please. your question. The first thing, uh, the, the thing I want to say about Yemen is that these, this group, the Houthis, they represent a very, in, in Yemeni society, they're about 5% of the population. They, they claim to be descendants of the Prophet through Ali, so they're Sayyid. The only way that 5% of a, of, of a population can dominate the remaining 95% is if you have this anti-American, uh, anti-imperial, mm. anti-Zionist, anti-Jewish. I mean, they have to maintain this constant uh, revolutionary zeal in order to keep their own population under their domination yeah. and control. So in other words, they will never give it up. And that's why the Iranian relationship is extremely important. And this now ties to the answer that I, I'd like to give you, which is that in the Gulf, there is a basic view, and this is shared by Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, even Qatar, that basically we want stability. We are for the status quo. We want to sell oil. We want to develop our economies. We want to diversify away from oil. And the only way to do that is to remain an ally of the United States. The American order has been good mm -hmm. to these countries. They, they view Iran as a, a, a force that wants to destabilize the region, largely because it wants to push America out of the region. <coughs> Pushing America out of the region would lead to incredible instability and will threaten the survival of these regimes. So ultimately, I think the Gulf countries see themselves almost caught between in this fight, a fight between the Iranian regime and the United States. And they very much want to be on the side of the United States. But they felt, I think, beginning with the Iraq war, um, like a jilted bride, you know? The, for the, the 2003 Iraq war. The 2003 war. war. They began to feel that America has you know, done things that have destabilized the region and given Iran opportunities to take advantage of mistakes committed by the United States. Mm -hmm. The Iraq war was one of them in 2003. And then after that, you had the uh, <coughs> siding of uh, President Obama with the Muslim Brotherhood against Mubarak in Egypt. Then you had the idea of pivoting to China, to the East, and abandoning the region and giving Iran, the regime in Iran, the kind of space. Obama, you know, famously said in an interview with Jeffrey Goldberg that, you know, the Iranians should, you know, share the region, right? So this was heard as Iran, America wants the regime in Iran to dominate the region. Um, and so they, they feel jilted, they feel abandoned by the, by the US, and as a consequence, they f and this focus on the nuclear and not on the bigger picture, which is the strategic picture that was, you know, very 
aptly already uh, presented here. Um, so, so their worry is this pincer movement that was talked about before. They're less worried about just the nuclear issue. But the Iranian regime has been extremely clever. And in fact, they've taken a page from the book, uh, that the, Soviet, the playbook of the Soviet Union. Because if you remember how the Soviets played the West in the 1970s and 80s, they found constituencies in the United States and in the West that supported their position. Mm. The, prince, the, the most important of these constituencies was this anti-nuclear constituency. And the Iranians have again cultivated this group in America and in Europe. And in the name of you know, not going nuclear, you kind of turned a, a, a blind eye to all this other stuff that mm -hmm. the Iranians actually want to do. They're, they're less, <laughs> I think, interested in the nuclear mm -hmm. themselves than they are in, in fact, dominating the region. Mm -hmm. So right. I, I want to follow up with, um, uh, we only have 12 minutes left, and I definitely want to get to the audience, so have your questions ready. But each of you with a US policy question. Uh, my former boss, Bill Burns, who's now CIA director, used to say, don't just admire the problem. You know, it offers some constructive uh, prescriptions as well. And so I guess I'll, I'll pose this to both Joel and to, to Bernie. Mm -hmm. It's the, the question of resolve, meaning will. You know, when we watched the Taliban retake Afghanistan, it just occurred to me that if your capabilities are 100 out of 100, like the United States, but your resolve, your will is a 10 out of 100, you can be defeated by an adversary whose capabilities are a 10 out of 100, but whose resolve is 100 out of 100. And it seems that, you know, the Islamic Republic uh, has perhaps a tenth of the capabilities of the United States. But the resolve to kick the United States out of the Middle East is perhaps 10 times uh, that. And so I, I'm curious, both from the perspective of how would you think about US strategy in Syria and Iraq when you have an adversary in Bashar Assad who's willing to slaughter half a million people, um, Shia militias who are, are willing to slaughter Hamas, and, and Gulf countries who, you know, they're not interested in um, you know, going out and, and, and forming militias. I'll, I'll say here in parentheses, I think one of the things that we commonly get wrong, President Biden, I think, has even misspoken about this. There's a misperception that Iran supports Shiite radicals, Saudi Arabia supports Sunni radicals. The major asymmetric advantage that Iran has over its Sunni adversaries like Saudi Arabia is that virtually all Shia radicals from India to Lebanon are willing to go out and fight for Iran whereas virtually all Sunni radicals like Al-Qaeda, ISIS, want to overthrow the government uh, of Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf countries. So Iran has this unique ability to harness Islamist radicalism in a way that no other nation state can do. Uh, just this question of resolve, Joel, you, you served most recently in, in, in government. How do we counter uh, Iran when, frankly, uh, many would argue that there's a bipartisan consensus to actually diminish America's presence in the Middle East? Okay, let me, let me I'm take a slightly roundabout approach there uh, and go back to the JCPOA. There were two fatal flaws to the JCPOA uh, that made it unsustainable as it was and as it would be if, it, if, we, if the U.S. goes back to it now. Uh, the first one is that it ends, it expires. <laughs> this is you know, per permanent concessions on one side and temporary on the other. Uh, that's why President Trump said this is not a good deal. But the second fatal flaw is that it takes, uh, it takes the most potent non-war tool that the United States and its allies have, and it takes it off the table and puts it behind JCPOA glass. The most New potent tool being economic sanctions. Economic sanctions, economic pressure. That's right. And uh, th this is why it, it, the Iranian regime, once the JCPOA is signed in the first two fiscal years of the government budget. And we helpfully, we know this because Rouhani helpfully published the numbers. In 2016 and 2017, across those two years, the Iranian regime increased its military budget by more than 40% at a time when the Iranian economy grew in single digits. So we know that they channeled a disproportionate uh, part of their windfall, their sanctions relief windfall and their unfrozen funds into their military budget. And there was consequently an explosion of Iranian missile development and proxy activity and aggression across the region. This is not rocket science. This is, you know, just connect the dots. Uh, if they get another windfall, that's what they'll do again. Uh, this is, so 
U.S. policy has got to take that into account. And the Iranian regime, the Assad regime, Hezbollah, I don't know about the Houthis so much, but, but those three are extremely vulnerable to U.S. economic pressure. That's why they work so hard uh, to evade it, either through uh, fake diplomatic deals or through just straight, straight out sanctions evasion through front companies and so on. Uh, because uh, we can touch the licit economies of all three of those states to, in a way that is devastating and they are not resilient to. They, they have no answer for it, nor do their other patrons like Russia. Uh, so I think the, the resolve the U.S. needs to show is to keep the economic pressure tool in play against the Iranian regime, the Assad regime, and Hezbollah, not be, and not go down the, I mean, it looks like this administration is about to do it again, is about to go back into and, and, uh, and accept that fatal flaw. But that means it, it will collapse. There, there, it looks like if they're going to reach a deal, the kind of deal they're going to reach is one that's going to collapse of its own weight because Congress, the U.S. people, and eventually Europe and East Asia are not going to tolerate uh, the idea of our Iranian hegemonic aggression across this vital region with no economic pressure response that le and, and be left with only two extreme responses, war or surrender. It, this, it's, it's not a sustainable approach. It will collapse of its own weight. And that's what then smart policymakers and thinkers should recognize that now. And they should be saying, pay no attention to the crazy, fatally flawed deal that may emanate from Vienna in the coming weeks or months. Let's do mature, rational thinking about what will have to come on the other side of that deal's collapse. Because that is what is going to happen. I think there's going to be a conversation later, perhaps, about uh, JCPOA. But, but Bernie, um, you know, I, I spent a year in Lebanon as a Fulbright scholar. And for me, one of the big takeaways of that year was that it takes decades or centuries to build a place and weeks to destroy it. <laughs> and I see this now with you know, these uh, Houthi drones uh, targeted at the UAE. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, you, you know well that um, these places, like whether it's you know, the UAE, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> they're trying to be global economic players, part of the G20. Um, you know, they, they call their vision Vision 2030 versus Iran's vision 1979. Yeah. How, how do they contend with uh, Iran, uh, with an adversary that's willing to do things like you know, launching drones and missiles at civilian targets or, or oil centers like Saudi Aramco? So th my worry, okay, my principal worry, and, and, and it's the one that I think will concentrate the minds of American policymakers. And it's one word, it's China. Because mm. the way the Gulf states are moving now is to basically say, well, okay, if you, the United States, are not able to provide the protection and the cover, we're going to diversify our armaments. We're going to start buying drones not just from China, but also actually Turkey. The Turkish president is about to visit uh, Riyadh uh, any day now. Um, so I think that you know, what they're doing is they're starting to think of China. And China has already positioned itself in the region. It's in Djibouti. They have a base, uh, ostensibly to fight piracy in, in, in the Gulf of Aden. So th this is the sort of slow but sure kind of move, and their, their oil is principally sold to East Asia. It's not being, it's not being sold uh, a, a, to the United States. So there are these interests that align, and, and I think it's very, very important for the U.S. to understand that what's happening in the Middle East, and it really you know, involves China and also involves leverage over China, because who, the, the, the power that will control those supply lines of energy will ultimately not just have you know, a, a uh, stranglehold over the global economy, but also a stranglehold over East Asia. Yeah, no, very good observation. Um, Fatima and Hanin, uh, um, I'll ask Fatima actually quite um, specific question, which is the was news reports this morning that the White House is uh, considering redesignating the Houthis as mm. a terrorist organization. And I know I, I don't like these uh, concrete, direct questions because nothing in life is 100 to zero. 
But what you see as kind of the relative benefits and relative costs of that potential designation. And Hanina, I'll leave my question to you a little more uh, broad, which is, if you were sitting down with Jake Sullivan, um, you know, what would you suggest to him as a U.S. strategy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Hezbollah? And we don't have time for that. Well, <laughs> we try to be brief because um, we have a lot of uh, audience members hungry to ask questions. So, okay. um, Fatima and Hanin. So, um, briefly on on the designation. Um, which I don't think the Houthis are going to take seriously because it doesn't really harm them that much. But I think um, it, it could be very beneficial to um, members of Congress, honestly, who have been sympathetic to the Houthis um, uh, without any reason to. Some of them call them, you know, sort of like freedom fighters. They don't understand what the Houthis are doing in Yemen. Um, they see them as indigenous people and they have this kind of sympathy towards them. And I think, you know, uh, having, having, the former administration to have designated them as, as terrorists and having the Biden administration as well to designate them as terrorists will bring everybody on the same page in terms of what is the intention of this group. Um, and I think there will be a lot of benefit just in terms of like refocusing uh, US fo um, foreign policy on, on that front. I know in a couple of weeks ago, I was interviewed about this on a Saudi-based uh, channel where I've had certain reservations and um, not necessarily just because of the humanitarian impact, because it, you know, with, with such a designation, um, there's gonna be a lot of dis disruption in, in humanitarian assistance, but also maybe, you know, how do you really differentiate between a Houthi and a non-Houthi? At the end, they're all Yemenis carrying the same passport. And I worry about what does this mean on the Yemeni citizen and how, uh, I mean, how will they be impacted if there are, for example, any sanctions that would be levied, et cetera? Um, you know, I mean, uh, ha having had a Yemeni passport at one time in my life, I know how difficult this could be uh, for just like an average uh, Yemeni citizen. So um, there are certain concerns, but I have to say, just having voiced that um, on, on Saudi TV, I, I had uh, people from the Yemeni community um, come back to me and saying, um, you're wrong. There are benefits to having them designate as a terrorist organization. Please reevaluate your position because um, A, they are terrorists. <laughs> they, they, they have been brutalizing Yemeni people. Um, you know, and, and I, I, it's completely bewildering how anybody can have sympathy for this movement that has been recruiting kids of seven and eight years old to go and, and fight in, in the wars. Um, they levy taxes, they're, you know, doing, doing um, or conducting just a brutal campaign on Ma'rib and other cities um, where they've advanced uncontested uh, for the past couple of years and also kind of like really unnoticed by international media. So when Saudi Arabia, you know, has an airstrike that can kill 20 or 30 people that generates headlines, but when the Houthis you know, kill maybe thousands of civilians over one year, it doesn't. Yeah. And I think people want to raise awareness to the brutality of the Houthis, um, the human rights violations, um, and the terrorism that they feel. And they want to feel equal. They, they don't want to feel that you have to, you know, that, 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 that the pressure has to be on the United States for them to be designated as terrorists when they're actually also suffering. And frankly, the person who contacted me, one of my friends who's actually in Ma'rib and fighting the Houthis, he said, we're fighting this war on behalf of the United States because what they're saying is death to America and it's not costing the United States anybody. Yeah. It's our blood. I'm always so. reminded of something Senator Chris Coons from Delaware said, Democrat, that uh, Iran exports its human rights abuses. That's one of Iran's top exports. <laughs> That's so, sad. Anina, uh, in two minutes, if Jake Sullivan were sitting here, what would you uh, offer him as uh, prescriptions on uh, how to think about Hezbollah, U.S. strategy toward Hezbollah? And Lebanon. Well, it's, it's, it's there. I have tons of uh, things to say, but in two minutes, I would focus on two main things. And I think, you know, because there's no policy for Lebanon, at all. I think the last time the U.S. had a policy for Lebanon, including Hezbollah, was the Bush administration and before that. But since then, uh, since the Obama administration, there hasn't been like a clear Lebanon policy, right? It has always been either sanctions, maximum pressure, or humanitarian aid, security aid to the LAF. Today, 
it is humanitarian aid and security aid to the LEF, which is great. The, these are needed, but these are not uh, a policy that would lead to actual change in Lebanon, right? So two things I would, I would focus on today. Hezbollah in Lebanon thrives through the Shia community and through their allies. If you can't do anything about the weapons because it has to go all the way through Iran, that's fine. But the only thing that would really, really, really bother Hezbollah is it is allies, okay? Alliances can be sanctioned. Hezbollah's sanctions can be effective in a certain way, but at the end of the day, their economy is cash, cash economy. They don't go through banks. They don't really need that kind of pressure. But their allies are all freaked out about sanctions and... Today, this administration is doing still sanctions, but not about allies, it's more about corruption, right? It has to come back. This sanctioning allies of Basile and, and, and others need to come back because today the elections is coming and they will be pressured by the street. And, and, and today you can see that if, if someone is sanctioned by the US, their business community will freak out. And this brings me back to the next level. The Hezbollah also thrives through their business community. Mm and thrives through the Shia community, but their core community really is the business community. And if you want to sanction allies and go after allies, it's not just sanctions, right? There, is a, there need to be a policy that includes sanctions. Sanctions is not a policy, it's a tool. But if you really want to go after allies, if you really want to go after Hezbollah, you have to corner them through their allies, and you have to corner them through their business community and the Shia community. And this is where stop focusing it's not about this administration. It's not about any administration. It's about the international community in general. We don't need another Shia leadership in Lebanon. We need viable economic and financial and social alternatives that are grassroots, that are up, down, uh, 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 from the grassroots all the way that, that like, this is, will create a certain leadership. It cannot be top down anymore. This cannot be the alternative that we need in Lebanon. They're gonna be killed. Work with the Shia community create an alternative that is viable today, and corner Hezbollah through the business community and their alliance in Lebanon. Weapons can be dealt with from another perspective, but this has to be done. It cannot be only humanitarian aid because that will always be taken advantage of. Thank you. Dr. Ganji, can I uh, open it up? I know we're out of time. Yeah, okay. The Supreme Leader says yes. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, if you can take the microphone, uh, just briefly introduce yourself. I hope this... Uh, couple of questions, and, um, and um, uh, yes, I think there's, maybe we go to the microphones, if you can briefly introduce yourself, and this wouldn't be an authentic Iranian event if we didn't start late and finish a little bit late. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Ali Kimiyai from American Mideast Coalition for Democracy. This question was for Mr. Abrams but he was rushed out of here. So by default, it would be addressed to Mr. Raber. Iranian people had three chances to get rid of the regime in Iran. The first one was in Reagan administration, the era, which at that time, there was a still a revolutionary fervor in Iran. And also, the administration was busy taking down the Soviets. The second chance was during uh, George Bush administration. That was a major disappointment. When all indication <coughs> was to attack Iran and majority of Iranians prayed for it. But the attacks were made to Iraq and Afghanistan. The third chance was during Trump administration. Again, Iranians looked forward to the best chance of regime change, but instead the administration seek the regime change of behavior. Mr. Abra mentioned a country that struggled 75 years for democracy. And Iran's struggle is only 43 years. Have they told you, I mean, you worked in administration, 
Have they told you of any timeline of when Iranians will claim back their country? Thank you very much. Uh, is that Shahriar Ahi? Please, <laughs> yes. You know me, so no introductions. Uh, classic mistake in, st in strategy. Fight the other guy's means, let him have his ends. It's clear that the nuclear program of IRI is to have an umbrella to deter its regional domination, deter escalation to high intensity violence so that they could use their massive superiority in low intensity violence through their proxy forces. What can rescue US policy from this classic strategy mistake to stick to J.C. Paul and, as Joel said, put everything behind that and forget about the ends. So that, as Bernie Heichel said, you get a region where you have enemies and you have deeply dissatisfied friends. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, fine. One last question. Okay. Yeah, please. Hi, I'll make this really quick. Thank you so much for such a great panel. Um, I'm a researcher on the Captagon trade, so Kareem, I was very intrigued by your question on the drugs trade in Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, and the greater Middle East. And my question is, we see a lot of production inside of Syria, large-scale production, and we see medium to small-scale production of Captagon in the Bekaa Valley near the Kalmu mountain range. We also see a lot of facilitation from IRGC-affiliated groups between that border region and also likely facilitate this drug trade into the Persian Gulf and new markets outside of the Middle East. So how do you see that role emerging in, this, uh, in, in 2022 and beyond, especially as a, uh, either an official or unofficial policy of the IRGC? Thank you. Can you do it in 30 seconds? <laughs> Please, because uh, lunch is next, so you're going to Sure, sure. Very quickly, um, I remember in 2017 having a conversation with Senator Ben Sass, and at the same time uh, having another conversation with back then um, um, uh, Paul Ryan. Um, there was an understanding that one of the biggest problems that the U.S. is facing is the regional shadow of the Islamic Republic. Um, and now we know that the administra last administration left the JCPOA and also killed Soleimani, and was, uh, Soleimani was very important in that calculation. Um, now, my question is that we're here on the verge of um, um, a new going back to nuclear deal. What is your prediction about what's going to happen if we do that when it comes to Iran expanding its shadow on the region, and how would the Russian new uh, encroachment into the Middle East and other places would play part into that effect. So my question is basically what's yeah, going to yeah. ha happen? To well put, concise, thank you. So um, uh, missed opportunities for US policy to forward uh, democracy in Iran. I think, Joel, that's probably for you. Um, perhaps all of you can react to um, you know, how are each of your countries going to be affected by potential revival of the deal and a cash windfall to Iran? And then, Hanin, Joel, uh, if you want to address very briefly the issue of drug trafficking. Um, and um, as I said, we stand before everyone in lunch, so please try to be as concise <laughs> as, as possible. Would you want to start? Yeah, I, I think uh, on the uh, democratic change in Iran, I mean, Bob Gates uh, uh, wrote and spoke about the importance um, in the pressure on the Soviet, late Soviet Union of the Helsinki Protocols, uh, human rights, uh, the, the, the human rights agenda. And, and so I don't know why, I mean, the United States, that should just be baked into our, into our policy, is to do something similar at every opportunity. Uh, that, that should have been the basis of our response to uh, the Green Movement crackdown and, and, each, uh, in, and, and so on. That should be at the forefront of, of our policy. In terms of, I mean, there is a timeline for, some, for regime change in Iran, and that's the longevity of the dictator, Ali Khamenei, who's been a dictator for 30, he, this is his 33rd year. Uh, he's, what is he, he's eight, 82 this year, or 83, 82. 
He's not going to live forever. He's not going to live much longer. There's going to be some kind of change. There's going to be a leadership transition in Iran. And the Iranian people, uh, that, that'll be an opportunity uh, uh, to see if there can be a change uh, for the good. Thank you. Yes, uh, in terms of the uh, deal and the revival of the deal and its effect on, on Lebanon and Hezbollah, I think the, um, Hezbollah is looking at this in the sense that the Iranian cash flow to their coffers would resume. Of course, this is not going to bail Lebanon because Lebanon today is different. You know, it's a collapsed state and they cannot just get Iran's money and bail Lebanon out. They're going to have some internal problems, but at least it will be able, they will be able to use that hard currency in order to um, fund the elections that are coming, uh, fund some of their allies, fund some of the Shia community that have been disillusioned of, of their distance. So it will help them, definitely. But it's not going to be, you know, like a ground shaking uh, financial upheaval for them, of course. However, and this brings me to the Captagon issue. One of the reasons why they have upped the Captagon production and smuggling and they have moved from this Im their image from its resistance to a cartel because they needed the money, right? Mm -hmm. So if the, Iranian, if the Iranians started sending more money and to satisfy their financial, ex their expenditures and what they need, they might actually uh, resort, uh, calm down on the Captagon production and the drug smuggling and everything. So the, 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 because they need to go back to their image as a resistance, non-corrupt uh, uh, movement that is clean and, and political. So this, this new image of a cartel and, and uh, drug uh, mafia is not good for them. So if they can get some money from Iran, probably they will calm this down. Mm. So this is, depends on what's going to happen in Vienna. Their policy in Lebanon will... Uh, Those are related. Are related, yeah. Uh, Fatima? I mean, I, I'm thinking, actually, if it doesn't happen, if the deal doesn't happen, then, then we see consequences on Yemen, because that has been the pattern in the past where mm -hmm. um, when the U.S. leveraged sanctions on Iran, you saw the Houthis react by blowing up um, ships in Fujairah and other places. So um, they have been a very expedient tool for the Islamic uh, regime yeah. in, in that sense. A friend of mine pointed out to me last night you know, that these Houthi attacks on the UAE are happening at a time of ostensible de-escalation. We're, <laughs> we're talking to them in Vienna about doing a deal and de-escalating. You know, what happens? If this is de-escalation, what is escalation? That's it's right. Like, uh, Bernie. Yeah, I, I mean, I think what Joel said and, 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 and um, what was said here, which is that you know, if Iran gets a windfall, it's going to do what it already did in mm. 2016. So we're yeah. going to see more um, non-state actor activity. Mm -hmm. And there's a limit to what I think countries like Saudi Arabia or the UAE can do to, I mean, they'll harden themselves as much as possible, anti-missile, anti-drone technologies, and so on. But you know, all it takes is for one, one skyscraper, skyscraper in Dubai to be hit. Yes. For that entire city and, and that whole model of economic, financial, uh, openness, trade, and so on, for it to collapse. Mm -hmm. and, that's the, the, and that's the sword that Iran and its proxies hold over these countries. Yeah, no, someone pointed out to me that, and I think this is unclassified information, but that one of the missiles that was headed, that the, Houthi, the Houthis had sent to the UAE was intended to hit Burj Khalifa, which is the tallest building in the world. It was shot down, but you know, he described it as the, a 9-10, a September 10th moment that, you know, are, are, you know wow. that, that would have that profound impact. Yeah. So thank you all for your patience, for, 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 for staying over, and please join me in thanking the wonderful speakers. Karim, uh, th thank you so much, uh, truly, for, for moderating such an excellent discussion, which, as one of the audience members, who I won't identify, just texted me saying, could have lasted for two more hours. You were also excellent. It was really a pleasure to have uh, such a distinguished uh, panel uh, about the Islamic Republic's uh, impact uh, in the Persian Gulf uh, and beyond uh, in the region. Uh, we thank you again, and we welcome each of you to lunch shortly uh, before our next panel. Thank you. <laughs>